Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I will be your moderator. During this episode of Constellations, we'll talk about the problem of space debris, including what it is and how it's impacted by recent technology advancements, such as the launch of LEO Mega Constellations. We'll also talk about the global regulatory landscape, as well as the technology solutions currently available to solve the problem. Chris spent a number of years at NASA, where he served as the NASA attache for Asia, the senior space policy official in the U.S. Embassy, Tokyo. He also is a leader in forging international cooperative partnerships around the world in the fields of earth science, space science, and human space exploration. What a modern guy you are, huh? I try to be, John, yeah. (laughs) Plus, MBA from Georgetown? Boy, you got a perfect background here. I I, I hope so. I'll try. Well, here we are at uh, Satellite 2019. We're surrounded by all kinds of companies doing all kinds of things. Very few of them are talking about space debris. So tell us about the origin of this problem, and then what are we looking at, really? So space debris is basically prior to the, the, the first launch of a satellite, 60-something years ago, 70 years ago, there was no space debris. Uh, it's all human-made, and it comes in all sizes. It comes from things as small as a paint chip that might have fallen off a satellite to things as large as an upper-stage rocket body or a failed satellite. So we're looking at literally hundreds of millions of pieces of debris up there in all of those sizes. For the stuff that we're really concerned about at this point now are things that are uh, larger than about 10 centimeters. And of those pieces, we're talking about 20 to 30,000 pieces of debris that are larger than a tennis ball, which could, a baseball, which could basically destroy a satellite is what we're talking about. So if I drive from here to Kansas City and I'm on an interstate road, I could have 10,000 pieces or it could derail my car instantly. That's that's basically the analogy we, we like to use. Uh, the, the, the orbital highway is just another highway. Uh, and the way I also like to look at it is it's kind of like a natural resource. You know, we're trying to clean up what is a natural resource. And just like on land, we have natural resources like rivers and oceans and mountains and, and forests. The orbital environment is another natural resource that we need to protect. And that's what we're out there to try to do. Now, if I drive to Kansas from here, you know, n- not a not a great chance of me getting hit by lightning. Makes this possible it could happen. So, what is the likelihood of collision with debris with today's launches or future launches? And even like get hit by lightning, or is it probable? Yeah. So it is a low probability, extremely high impact event. So we recognize that there's unlikely to be a major collision that uh, destroys the orbital environment anytime in the near future, but. The possibility exists, and we know it's happened before. Everyone's familiar with, of course, the iridium collision that happened about 10 years ago. It's, it's a proof that it does happen. It can happen. So what we want to do is we want to be the prevention, not the cure. We want to be able to fix this problem before it happens, because if you try to cure it after it happens, it's going to be too late. If you get to the point where there's multiple collisions and each collision creates additional possibilities for collision, then you're looking at an orbital environment that can't be used. So to answer your question, yeah, it, it's, it's not going to happen. And we, I don't want to be an alarmist saying, oh, you know, it's going to tomorrow we're going to our orbital environment is going to be destroyed and you can't use your cell phones anymore. That's not what we're trying to say. We're saying that the possibility exists and the possibility is only going to keep increasing. Well, when you talked about uh, this domino effect of one collision causing another collision, this reflects on, on this, this Kessler syndrome many, many years ago, like 1978, they started talking about this. Yeah, I mean, it's been 40 years that people have talked about this problem, and and Dr. Kessler was was prescient in what he was saying. At that time, the orbital environment was pretty empty. There weren't a lot of satellites up there, but in the last 40 years, that number has grown significantly. So when we look at how many satellites are up there now, there's about 2,000 active satellites right now. Uh, Since the launch of the first satellite, Sputnik, there's been about 8,000 satellites launched into orbit, right? So there's been a steady increase in the amount of uh, assets, amount of things in space that humans have made. And yes, Dr. Kessler talked about this 40 years ago and looked forward and said, if we keep doing this and we don't take some action to mitigate this problem, there could be a uh, substantial increase in debris, a uh, kind of exponential increase as one piece 
piece hits another piece and it creates 10 pieces. And those 10 pieces could hit more pieces that create 100, could create 1,000. And then it gets to the point where that orbital environment is unusable. Well, you know, I, I think uh, when I think of space debris, I, I think of trying to control it. And then I think of regulation, which is kind of a nasty word here in Washington, D.C. But, you know, there's some regulatory policies associated with this. But it's such an open area out in space. I mean, it's hard to even talk about regulations. Is it? Ah, it's. An, I mean, the people call it an orbital commons. Uh, you know, some people like that term. Some don't. But that's basically what it is. Nobody owns the orbital environment. So how do you regulate something that nobody owns? And it's a huge issue. So we're a technology company, right? We're, and we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. But we're trying to develop a, a, a technology to solve this problem. And most of our team, I'd say 70% or 80% are engineers. So we're a technology focused company. But if we just develop the right technology, that doesn't guarantee that we're solving the problem. And it doesn't guarantee that we have a sustainable business. So we need to focus also on the policy side, which is what you're referring to here, John. So we need to focus on the policy aspects, the technology aspects, and the business aspects, you know, the who's going to pay for it aspects, which again, I'm sure we'll get to in the, in later in the, in the discussion. So on the policy side, we are focused on talking to both domestic governments, so governments, the U.S., European governments, Japanese governments, as well as international organizations like the U.N. or World Economic Forum. And so we're looking, we need both of those to come together to try to influence a solution. And there's a lot of complex discussions happening right now, but the interest is increasing, and you see it both domestically and in international organizations. Well, you hinted at the topic, and I'm going to have to dive in here. I'm going to give you the Tom Cruise question here, and the Tom Cruise question is... Show me the money. Show me the money. Show me the money. Who's going to pay for this? I mean, if, if I have a rocket that goes up there, am I responsible for it? Am I responsible for a rocket that was sent up 20 years ago by another country? Who's responsible for what? I mean, human beings are not going to pay to uh, uh, clean up uh, an environment that's not their own environment. Huh? It's, it is a thorny question, and it's a difficult one that we are thinking about all the time. We have people on our team who are basically economists who are looking at this and thinking, okay, how do we frame this issue? Uh, how do we make people understand the concern, and how do we find the people to pay for it? So basically, we're looking at two business streams. We're looking at one which is focused on governments and one which is focused on commercial side. So starting with the government side, governments have been the majority of, uh, of launches and satellites have been government launches and satellites in the past 70 years. So for the stuff that's up there now, we think the government should be putting some money in to bring some of that down. Some of the old failed satellites, some of the upper stage rocket bodies that are up there, a government's primary interest is protecting its citizens. Uh, citizens are reliant on the space environment, so we think that it should be the governments that start bringing down a few of these pieces. Now, now if you bring down a couple pieces a year, let's say three to five pieces a year, we start bringing down, we're going to drastically reduce the risk that there's going to be an accident. So we're talking to governments right now about uh, potential missions where we go up and bring down a large upper stage, develop that technology, start working on those regulations where we can go up and grab a piece and deorbit it and then make the environment cleaner. So that's one of our business lines. The other one is we're looking at the commercial side. And the commercial side is basically what this podcast is named, the Constellations Podcast. We're looking at these new large constellations that are out there. So many satellites are going to be launching. I mentioned earlier that there's been about 8,000 launched since the start of the space age. Over the next 10 to 15 years, you know, John, there's going to be potentially 15 or 20,000 satellites that are plan to be launched over the next decade or more. So if we're looking at that massive increase in the amount of things in space, we're going to we're talking to companies and saying it's in your best interest not just from an environmental perspective, not just to clean up your trash like we tell our kids all the time, pick up what you what you throw on the ground. That's great. You should do that from an environmental perspective, but also from a business continuity perspective. If I'm launching a thousand satellites into a similar orbit, I don't want to take the risk that one of those fails and then becomes a a, a, a danger to my other my other satellites. So in order to prepare for that, what we're saying is put on something, uh, a, a docking plate 
before you launch your satellites, kind of like the hitch on the back of a car. So, you know, if your car fails on the highway, a AAA can come and attach to it and pull it out of the way. We're saying put one of those things on your satellite. So if it fails, we can go up and grab it and pull that out of the way. So long answer to your question, John, but we're looking at two different business lines. One, talking to the governments about investing and bringing down some debris that's already up there. Two, talking to the commercial sector about preparing to mitigate any potential future debris cars, hitches. I was thinking about my first car. A 1963 Corvair. I paid $300 for it. How about that? Probably the most dangerous vehicle on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> unsafe at any speed. Believe If it even started, it would be unsafe <laughs> if I get out of the driveway. But had no airbags, had no seatbelts. If I went out to buy a car today, you know, seatbelt, a- airbags, safety, warning systems, everything else, it's mandated. And so, should that be part of your objective is to, to mandate? Okay, so if you are uh, company ABC about to put up a satellite, guess what? You mandatory have to have a way to decommission the satellite. I think that's got to be part of the approach. So governments are talking about that. And for any company to launch a satellite, you need to get a license, a mission license. And those mission licenses comes from authorizing states, governments. And so governments now are talking about saying, if you launch a satellite, if you want a mission license from us, from this country, then you should have a backup deorbit mechanism. That's some of the the things that people are talking about. And you've seen that uh, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking by the FCC, for example, where they're saying, uh, let's look at some new regulations for how uh, we license these satellites going forward. One of the things that's on that potentiality is, do we do we say you have to have a backup door mechanism? You have to prepare yourself for safety orbit once your mission is done. Other countries are looking at the same thing. We have offices in Japan and the UK as well. Both of those countries are looking at similar types of, of legislation. So there is domestic focus on mandating that there is some kind of uh, some kind of rules for how you launch. And the commercial sector sees this, and they, of course, like to get ahead of some of these regulations and say, hey, we're already preparing for this kind of stuff. And there's, there, for example, a group called CONFERS, uh, and CONFERS, C-O-N-F-E-R-S. And this group is focused on developing standards for in-orbit servicing. Uh, it was initially funded by DARPA, now being uh, it's being organized or led by Secure World Foundation. And we're a part of this group, uh, industry-led group that's saying, let's start talking about how we can develop these standards for in-orbit servicing uh, ahead of any kind of regulation so we can show we're prepared for this new world. Thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast, even in Japan, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> if you're listening and want to get alerts when new episodes are available, simply go to Google, type in Constellations Podcast, click Kratos and sign up. Maybe even more of Chris somewhere down the road. Who knows, huh? <laughs> well, here we are at Satellite 2019, and uh, uh, we're talking about space debris, which most people here aren't, I don't think. Um, so, uh, your Elsa D can take and go up and 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 bring back debris, and we talk about preventing. What about the stuff that's already out there? I mean. Uh Are there organizations that try to go out there and and recover debris right now? There aren't really any out there that are trying to go up and and bring down debris. There's a lot of talk, and and there's been a lot of talk. And you go to different conferences, and you hear a lot of talk about it. I know at the the IAC or Space Symposium, there's always a significant amount of – discussion about space debris, but there's nobody that's up there trying to to bring down the stuff that's there now. You mentioned LCD. LCD is our first technology demonstration mission, end-of-life services by Astroscale demonstration. Uh, And so this is going to launch next year, and this is going to be proving our capabilities to find and attach to a piece of debris. And so with that mission, what we're going to do is launch up two satellites together, and then we're going to separate them in orbit. And one is going to be a larger satellite, our servicing satellite, and the other is going to be a piece of dummy debris, our our client satellite. And we're going to separate them and then connect several times using a magnet. Now, that, that, that dummy debris, that client satellite, is going to have on it that docking plate that I mentioned. So that hitch, it's going to have on that, and we're going to connect using a, a magnet. So we're going to connect using a magnet. We're going to separate three different times and do three different demonstrations of how we can uh, connect to debris. The second time, we're going to tumble the debris. 
move it around so it'll simulate a kind of out of control piece of debris and we'll move around and map our tumble to the debris and attach to it and the third time we'll lose the debris we'll go farther away and then using both ground based and onboard sensors find it and attach to it again so demonstrating the capabilities to attach to that now all those capabilities those GNC guidance navigation and control capabilities that we use for LCD we can use those for other missions we'd use those for the missions that for the debris that's already up there. The big difference is the capture mechanism. The debris that's up there is not magnetic. We can't use that magnet to grab on to an upper stage rocket or a failed satellite right now. So we have to think about a different way to capture it. And so we're looking at other opportunities or possibilities for capture, including robotic arm or, or some others. So we're looking at the different um, possibilities. There are other companies that are talking about doing this. Uh, there was a mission that used a, a harpoon and a net called Remove Debris. Um, but there's not anybody else that's doing this big picture or doing it as a full business the way we're talking about doing it. I tell you, I read about that Airbus harpooning thing, and I thought if I call up my son Kevin and said, "Okay, Kevin, I'm gonna send you out in space," and you'll harpoon, he he go tomorrow. I mean, what a, what a fun <laughs> thing to do out there harpooning stuff, Dad. It's great. <laughs> it could be fun. It could be a little bit difficult for Kevin up there, but um, you know, that's why I think they're using robotic technology. But it's. It, it, it's one possibility. A harpoon is one possibility. A net is another possibility. We initially were looking at a, um, a gecko material, kind of like an adhesive. Uh, that's another possibility. So these are all technologies that are being discussed and considered. We're probably focusing more on the potential of a robotic arm, but we're keeping those options open as we, as we take step-by-step, -step, incremental steps toward uh, developing a solution. Douglas Brinkley uh, wrote this book called Space Barons. I just finished it, oh, last week. And uh, it brings up a four-letter word, and the four-letter word is fail, F-A-I-L. There's been a lot of failures with Elon Musk, a lot of failures with Jeff Bezos. I mean, I mean some ones are on the front page, but this, and so if company A puts something in orbit and it fails and blows up, I mean, are they going to be responsible for cleaning that up? I mean, this, is, this has to be built into what's going to happen because we're not going to have 100% success for the next 10 years. I mean, 8,000, 20,000 more, somebody's going to fail. So, that, John, that's exactly our point. And so we know that nobody is planning to fail. We know that nobody expects to fail, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to. But this is the space business, and these things happen. So we think that companies should be prepared for that potentiality. Uh, and, of course, everybody is building their satellites to the highest standards, and the technology has improved. And so it's gotten, of course, much better on all levels. But – the possibility still exists. So prepare yourself before you launch, first on the technical side, prepare yourself before you launch, put on that plate, make sure that just in case something happens, we're there to help you clean it up. A third party is there to help you clean it up. So on the technical side, yeah, we're preparing for that. On the policy side and the business side, uh, that's that's the discussions that are happening now in governments and why there's legislation and, and, and regulations that are being considered that can say, if these things happen, you, company A, are responsible for taking care of it. Uh, and so those discussions are currently underway, and they're, and they're difficult, um, but they have to happen. We have to get there. You're a pretty international fellow, and your company is everywhere, it seems. Uh, there's an organization called uh, ESA, and they have this thing called the Clean Space Initiative. It seems like it plays right exactly what you're talking about. Is it. So we're working with ESA closely, and, and you mentioned our offices. Yeah, we have our, our headquarters is in Tokyo, Japan, where we have about uh, 45 people. Uh, in the U.K., we have an office out in Harwell, uh, where we have about 20 people. We have a couple people in Singapore, and we just opened an office in the U.S., in Denver, Colorado, last month. So we we are looking at the three main areas of uh, kind of the space legislative and business areas that we're looking at, Europe, Japan, U.S. We now have all three of those covered. So we're, we're a global company right now, uh, and this is a global problem. So it needs to have input from all the space agencies, all the governments, all the commercial companies. So you mentioned ESA. We're working with ESA. Uh, we're working with JAXA, the Japan Space Agency. The, our U.S. efforts are more nascent, but we're now talking to U.S. regulators and we're talking to the NASA and, and other uh, companies and uh, agencies here. So we have to cover the globe to solve this problem. 
So here's the question that uh, students will ask us. So how long is this going to take, you know? So how long will it take to reduce the amount of space debris? Will your kids see it? Will your grandkids see it? I mean, how long is this problem going to take? It's hard to put a number on it. What we want to be able to do is just start addressing the problem, and that's what we haven't done yet. And you reference our kids, our grandkids. That's what we're trying to do this for. We're a company. We're a for-profit company, and we think that there's a business case here for this. But we're also an environmental company. We don't want to have our kids 50 years down the line saying, man, I wish my father or grandfather had helped solve this problem when it was a solvable problem, not when there's been accidents and, and now we can't use the orbital environment and now we can't use uh, GPS and cell phones and uh, everything that we rely on satellite data for. So uh, sorry, to, I'm not trying to dodge your question, John, but it's, it's hard to put a distinct number on it. The, the, the issue is let's start solving it sooner. Let's start mitigating the potential for future debris sooner so our kids don't have to deal with the dire consequences later. I just uh, I was thinking of a headline breaking news here, but breaking news would be can't use your GPS because there's too much debris. That'll get people to act. I mean, I mean, think about it. Go walk up to anyone in the street and go, hey, by the way, you can't make any telephone calls today and you're going to get lost. <laughs> can't use your GPS. Can't do your online banking. Can't call your 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 daughter in Africa. Can't uh, call your friends in Europe. Can't uh, watch the, the World Cup or Olympics game on TV because the uh, the orbital environment has been too contaminated to use. The, the, the amount of, of use that we have of satellite data the average person doesn't even recognize how significant it is. And so what we want to do is let people know how significant it is, make sure that they're aware that this is a problem and that it needs to be solved. People here in this community generally are aware of the problem. Outside of it, the, the awareness is growing, and we want to make sure that people continue to stay aware. Two-minute drill here, Chris. Why don't you look in the future, and, and uh, are there any, maybe at the show floor here, 2019, are there technologies maybe in the show floor here or on the horizon that could solve this problem? So this is what we're working on every day. We have our, I, I mentioned LCD, but that's just the first step. That's just the first step. We're doing technology road mapping within our company. We have a team that is right now assessing, okay, what are the technologies out there that are needed in terms of propulsion, in terms of the guidance, navigation, and control, AI? You know, we want to make sure that the human doesn't have to be in the loop on all this, that we can automate a lot of this stuff. So that's the kind of thing that's going to change the game when we do this. And capturing, how, what, are, what are better ways to, to grab on to something and make sure that we that we were able to deorbit it. So we're, we have a team right now that is looking at all of these types of future technologies, assessing where we can find the best value and the best use for these, and then apply those down the line. LCD is the first step. It's an important step, but it's just the first step. And we're going to keep evolving those technologies as we go forward. Well, I'm looking forward to see this happen because I'm going to have grandkids too, and I want them at least to call me. <laughs> That's exactly, a big motivation, John. huh? Yes. A human motivation. <laughs> Chris, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, Chris Blackerby, COO, Astroscale. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.